everyone. My name is Anne Albright. I'm a PhD candidate at Virginia Tech. Thank you so much for coming to my presentation today, where I'm going to be discussing the experimental retrofit of non-ductile shear walls, as well as my numerical analysis. So the main problem that we have is there are a lot of structures on the West Coast, in California particularly, that were built in the pre-1970s time frame and they don't have our current seismic standards. So if a large earthquake event happens, they're in danger of falling over killing a lot of people. That's the main basic motivation for this project. I'll try to make up a little time. So typical failure modes of reinforced concrete shear walls are diagonal failures, flexural failures, lap splice bar failures, um, you can see in the pictures on the left these diagonal tensile and diagonal compression shear failures. And on the right side, also very typical are bar buckling, concrete crushing. Really bad could be shear sliding of a shear wall. You don't want that to happen. Um, also, out of plane wall buckling could be an issue. So we wanted to make sure that we developed a specimen that was in line with current uh, older building types that actually had real properties that existing buildings have. So we did this study on existing building types in the California region. So we looked at a few different types of shear walls. This first type is uh, what we define as pilasters or barbell sections. They have larger clumps of concrete on the end. They kind of look like a big I-beam section. And what I want to point out with these sections is that the web has very light reinforcement in it, just 0.2%. Whereas the pilasters, or these end barbell regions, the columns, have much higher reinforcement ratios, 3.5% or more. So that's really where all of the main steel is concentrated in this type of wall. We also consider rectangular walls uh, with lap splices, because lap splicing is very common in shear walls, flange walls. And then typical material properties from this time period were a lot lower than the strength that we typically get today. So the wall strength of concrete, especially going after the ultra high performance concrete, is kind of laughable how weak the, this concrete compressive strength is, just three or 4,000 PSI, and a steel strength of just 40 KSI. So the objectives of my research, really to investigate the typical damage patterns that would occur during an earthquake event, a seismic event, for this type of non-ductile shear wall, I also want to look at retrofitting. It's going to be a lot cheaper, more cost-effective, environmentally friendly to retrofit a structure rather than paring it all down and building a brand new shear wall in place. Not to mention dough. So I looked at, I'm looking at two current retrofit strategies. The wall on the left is unretrofitted. It's our control specimen. The middle specimen is fiber reinforced polymer. And then we also looked at shock creep. Um, we also are doing numerical modeling for this project, so we want to further validate our numerical models. And ultimately, I would love to be able to provide some real design recommendations that can be implemented so people know how to retrofit in a safe way for a shear. So I've completed the testing for these first two specimens, the control and our FRP, and then we're in the process of the shock treatment. So the specimen we finally decided to build is a six inch thick web, four feet wide, with a vertical reinforcement ratio in the web of 0.25%, very light. And then the pilasters, these end column regions, have vertical reinforcement ratios of 3%. So the steel in the web is all concentrated out in the web. Remember that. We also applied an axial load on our specimen of 200 kips, which is, is a reinforcement or a ratio of 0.1. And then I'm going to show some load displacement curves, and the displacement node that I'm measuring from is at the top of our wall. So it's a 12 foot tall wall. This is also a half scale specimen. Um, so I'm going to note all of that. So this is the video of our control specimen as it goes through degradation. So we're starting in the load displacement cycle, and I'm going to point out what happens as it goes through. So the Cracks in the web region really start developing, and they start at the base of the wall, and then they slowly increase in their angle until we really end up forming a full diagonal strut from each corner of the wall, and you can see the diagonal cracks getting higher and higher up, and that followed in the columns as well. You can trace the cracks occurring in the pilaster all the way up the wall, and then as we get into a drift ratio of about 0.75% to 1%, the cracks really start to localize, and they'll start to open up. 
And as that crack opens up in the middle of the web, the only reinforcement that's there to carry it is very light 0.3%. It was just almost nothing in the web of the wall. And so what happens is the reinforcement fractures and it breaks. And so as this crack gets bigger and bigger, I mean, you can see it with your naked eye. This crack is getting dangerously large. You can hear also. And then we have the strain gauges inside of the wall, the popping of all this vertical and horizontal reinforcement in the wall because it's just not strong enough to carry the load. And so what happens is this large triangular portion of the wall ends up shearing into the toe. And we have this toe failure. This is a very dramatic, sheer, um, non-ductile toe crushing failure. So not a safe way to um, fail a structure. Typically in structures we want a much more ductile, a slow response so that people have time to evacuate the building. So this is just an AutoCAD representation of the cracking pattern as it developed. You can see a 0.5% drift. We have cracks, diagonal cracks all the way up the specimen. And then at 1%, we're really localizing those cracks. They're getting a lot larger. And at 1.5%, we have this sheer crushing failure in the toe. And then this is our analysis. We use a nonlinear beam truss model, which is much more numerically efficient than a finite element continuum model. And it's able to capture the inelastic uh, failure mode of this structure with bar buckling and uh, the rupture of the bars as well. This is the analysis of our numerical results with the actual experimental force displacement curve. This is the hysteretic curve with our tested material properties. And you can see it follows the displacement and the strength degradation quite well. The yielding occurs uh, nearly in the same spot, and then our crushing failure occurs in the same uh, drift ratio. So now onto our retrofitted specimen. This is the fiber reinforced polymer. This is a picture of them installing it. Um, you can see that we've anchored the fiber reinforcement, uh, which was generously donated by Simpson Strong Pie. I'll thank them later in the slide. Uh, it was anchored into the pilasters, about six inches. And the anchors are sandwiched between two sheets of fiber reinforced polymer, which are aligned in the horizontal direction. So that's the main strength improvement that we're hoping to get. So this video should hopefully play. If it doesn't, sorry guys, I'm missing out. It's a cool video. Um, I'll just explain the degradation process. So. This uh, specimen failed in a very different method from the first one. So what happened is that we actually have a lot of damage in the toe regions of the columns first. So as we slowly start to push the specimen back and forth, we do get cracks in the web, but they're not localizing. They're there, but they're not taking the majority of the damage. Where the damage is getting forced is into the toes, mainly, of the columns. And so that means the flexural reinforcement in the columns are able to take all of the load that's getting pushed into the specimen rather than that wall and rather than those diagonal cracks. So at 1.5% drift, where the first specimen really failed, we barely delaminated the fiber reinforced polymer. So you can see just small yellow spots on the wall where the, it was delaminated. But ah, but really, the fiber reinforcement is holding the web of the wall together and not allowing those cracks to form, and then that allows the pilasters to utilize their full flexural capacity. So at 2% drift, we get a little bit more delamination, but still the fiber reinforced polymer is holding pretty well. And then where we get the major delamination is at our failure drift percent for the specimen at 2.5%. Um, so the first real mode of failure in this specimen is much more flexural mode where the column and the vertical reinforcement, where remember we have all that steel, there's very little steel in the web in these pilasters, we're getting flexural uh, failure modes with yielding, it's ductile, and there's also bar buckling and concrete crushing. Here's another picture of the FRP, you can see in the positive drift ratio that at 2% we have a little bit of delamination, and then we also have these cracks in the back of the specimen. 
which are now starting to open and localize. And then we also have crushing in the web at 2.5%, at the toe where these cracks have localized. So similar to the first specimen. But this is our model for our specimen. The, not, as I mentioned, nonlinear beam press elements. We also use shell elements for the FRP overlay and adhesive elements uh, to account for the debonding of that overlay. And we have spring elements for the FRP anchor that we're going all the way up and down the column. You can see that our results match quite well. The FRP is delaminated at our 2% drift, which is where we did see it in the test, the majority of that delamination. And then in the final uh, drift ratio, of FRP is fully delaminated, and really the majority of the... Um, the force in the specimen is in the concrete now. So that's what you can see in this right side of the beam truss model is that the concrete and the base of the structure has taken all that damage. This is a comparison of the results between the unretrofitted specimen and our retrofitted specimen. You can see we didn't gain very much strength, only 165 kips versus 154 kips. But we did get a lot more ductility out of our structure, and our failure mode is much more flexurally dominated than shear and brittle dominated. And then you can validate our results more in the um, strain in the vertical rebar, where in specimen two, that vertical rebar was able to reach more of its flexural capacity. It's much higher than the strain in the rebar from the first specimen, where it wasn't able to develop that full capacity. And then the diagonal peak strain makes sense as well, measuring across the face of the web, it was much higher in the first specimen where the failure mode was characterized by that diagonal tension failure. And you could see those cracks really opening. We could visually see that versus just 0.03 in the second specimen. So our future work is with shotcrete. So you can see our second shotcrete specimen painted white right behind our broken FRP specimen, and we're hoping to test that in the community. So these are some resources I used. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the National Institute for Standards and Technology for sponsoring this project and since the strong type of donating the materials, as well as many other people that wouldn't be possible to do this project without our principal investigators and my advisor, Dr. Puchmanos and Dr. Juan Marcio Delso. And this is us in front of our broken wall. And we definitely couldn't have done this without our advisory committee, who were instrumental in helping us pick how we would retrofit what's commonly used in the field and what could actually potentially be Thank you all so much.